name of my love, Moses, merciful, most gracious. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning to everyone. Professor Saint Babu, President of Canada University. Professor Hendem Rabia, the Vice President for the Postgraduate and Research Affairs. Professor Well Tayyibani, the Vice President for Education and Student Affairs. And Professor Abdelhamid Khadr, the Vice President for Community Services and Environmental Development Affairs. The Dean of the Faculty of Arts, Professor Mahmoud Maddawi, and the dear colleagues of the Department of English Language and Literature, our dear students, graduate students and researchers, welcome all to the Demiata English Seminar, the first session of the academic year 2021. The best words to be spoken at the beginning of this seminar are the holy words from the Holy Quran, the truthful words of Allah Almighty, who said, O mankind, we created you male and female, and appointed you races and tribes, that you may know one another. An academic seminar is a great opportunity of learning for all established scholars and the passionate seekers of knowledge. The Miata English Seminar gives a chance of wider range of interactive academic discussion between scholars and researchers. The usual seminar is usually held to discuss the suggested research topics of postgraduate students who aim at registering for the higher educational degrees of MA and PhD. The innovative idea of Domiata English Seminar as agreed among the teaching staff members of our department is to give an opportunity to these young researchers to listen to the resourceful scholars giving presentations of their latest academic research findings in the field of English language and literature, as well as other interdisciplinary fields of knowledge. The Miata English Seminar basically aims at hosting great scholars from other universities for the purpose of exchanging expertise and knowledge, essential for the benefit of our dear students in the Department of English Language and Literature. I remember, as sure as I know, every true seeker of knowledge in this room does, how passionately and patiently I traveled everywhere in order to have even the slightest glimpse of knowledge. I traveled near and far in order to have the great honor of meeting knowledgeable scholars and learning from them but few bits and pieces of knowledge in the shortest minutes ever they could offer me. The Miata English Seminar is a great chance for our dear students in the Department of English Language and Literature to listen to the professors who come to enlighten us with their highly esteemed presence and resourceful knowledge. Today, our happiness is the greatest, to be honored by the generous participation of our dearest professor, Dr. Sayyid Dadur, the great scholar of English linguistics in the Miata English Seminar's first session. Please welcome and greet our dear professor. Uh, 
First of all, forgive me because I just not the time to ask in English. Because of the administration and uh, all that stuff as well. That made me feel like uh, I'm just an actual person rather than a decent person of the system. But I hope that you will forgive me if I excuse myself from the speak up again because I don't know how to do this each day or every day post. But uh, well, thank you very much for this invitation and uh, I wish you well and I wish you a very good and successful week and of the season. Thank you very much for Thank you, Professor President of the University. And on behalf of all the teaching staff members of the Department of English Language and Literature in the Miami University, we have the great honor to present to you, dear professor, the honorary Chief of the Miata English Seminar. And now, it is time for honoring our dear students who ranked first in their classes in the academic year 2019-22. Those students are the ones who got the highest degrees, who top the scores, and please allow me to present them these Memorial Honorary Prisons for their outstanding accomplishment. Please, William Hisham, uh, Mariam Hisham, uh, Abdel Aziz Khalil, please come. Mariam. Reem Abdul Aziz Abdusat. Reem Abdul Aziz Abdusat. Mariam Muhammad Ibrahim Al Kashif. Fatma Zahra Abdul Hamid Al Zogi. Fatma Zahra Abdul Hamid Al Zogi. Fatma Zahra Mohsin Muhammad. Fatma Zahra Mohsin Muhammad. Yumna. Muhammad Muhammad Atiti, Yumna Atiti, Amal Aydin Ali, Amal Aydin. Wissam Ibrahim Gabr Saleh. Amal Ali Abdu. Amal Ali Abdu. Nada Muhammad Ibrahim Sayyid. Nada Muhammad Ahmed Sayyid. Nada Muhammad Ahmed Sayyid. Amal Ashraf Abdul Hamid, Amal Ashraf Abdul Hamid, you know it happens, it happens every now and then. 
These things happen. These things happen. Thank you. Amal Ashraf Ibrahim. And it is also our greatest honor to deliver this honorary shield to our guest of honor, Professor Leila El Ben, Professor of Linguistics, Dr. Sheikh University. And now it is time to be honored. It is our pleasure to listen to Professor Leila Balben, Professor of Linguistics and the head of the Department of English Language and Literature, delivering her speech and giving her presentation. And the topic is actually very interesting. It is understanding human language. Please welcome Professor Leila Bilbao. to be here in this place for the first time. I'm amazed actually by the place and by the people. And I would like to say, Professor Sayed uh, Abur, the uh, president of Tomiata University for his kind and warm reception. And uh, really I was amazed by his personality and uh, his insight as a president of this a lovely uh, university. Thank you, Doctor, for the reception, and thank you to everyone. Also, I'd like to say, Doctor, uh, for the first time today, I uh, met them. It was really my pleasure to meet Doctor Hindan uh, Rabia, the director of the University of Washington. It's my pleasure to meet you. Also, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome and to thank uh, Dr. Wael Fagibari, Naib Rais Sel Jamal Shibur Abdullah. Thank you, Dr. Wael. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank someone who was so welcoming, but uh, unfortunately, I didn't catch his name, Dr. Yeah, Dr. Mahmoud Al Dr. Mahmoud Al Maghdawi. I got your name here, but I thought it was uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Hayes. Uh, sorry for the confusion. <laughs> thank you, thank you all. I'd also like to thank my dear colleague Dr. Rehem for her reception and for her warm welcome. I'd like to thank everyone here, um, my dear uh, colleagues and my dear professors and my students, my dear students, congratulations for those who have been uh, awarded certificates today for their uh, wonderful success. Thank you all, and uh, I'm very happy to be with you. And uh, today, um, I'm going to talk about a topic that appeals to me because it appeals to every one of us, which is we always ask ourselves, what's language? And we want to know the secrets, some of the secrets of this incredible thing that sets us apart from non-humans, that makes us really who we are as human beings. That thing that is a window, our window to the world. Language is our window to the world. It makes us see the world the way it likes us to see. It's a true language that we construct this world, we represent this world, we see this world, we believe, we think, we believe, and so on and so forth. Okay, 
Also, it's language that we all love, and sometimes we die for, and we fight for. Language that we know about it, although we do not know that we know about it. It's a language that is, its love runs deep in every one of us. What is this thing which is called language? What's this thing that makes us make such incredible things in civilizations and intellectual accomplishments? It's language. Without language, humans cannot make any of these achievements. Any civilization, any sort of exchange. We cannot exchange knowledge without language. We cannot construct a culture and social practice without language. Language is everywhere and is everything in us. Imagine life without language, it can't be there. It can't be there. And this is why uh, I try to um, talk a little bit about this incredible thing. Uh, the lecture is uh, going to cover the following points as quickly as possible. First, what's human language? What's special about human language? Language production and perception, how we produce and perceive language. Language is thought and what view, how language shapes our worldview. And number five, aspects of language, of language study. How do we study language? And what are the different fields that contribute to our understanding of this thing which is called language? And finally, I finish with aha moments ahead, talking about the prospects of the future in the field of linguistics and how language will be dealt with in the future. Okay? Um, th these questions I raised, actually was language a simple question, but it's not simple at all. Why? Because it's a puzzling thing. Language has puzzled everyone, starting from Aristotle, who said that language is sound, is meaning. And then Galileo said that language is meaning with sound. And then Descartes, and non field, and behaviorists, and cognitivists, and nativists, and so on. Everyone has been intrigued by this thing which is called language. However, I appeal to the views proposed by Noam Chomsky, the greatest philosopher of language, uh, to, in my point of view. He says that language is not invented, it is something that is innate in us. We are born with it, it's part of our makeup. It's a part of our genetic and biological makeup. We have language areas that are there in our brain, in our body. It's something that, and language organs are growing and maturing like any body organ. So it's not something that has been coming from outer space, no, or something that we acquire from the environment. No, it's something that built in us and there is an interaction between what we have and the surrounding environment. Okay? Uh, language, when we talk about language, I'm talking about language with a capital L. I'm not talking about a particular language. I talk about human language, which is human language faculty. The faculty that we are born with, which is what? What is the essence? It's a computational process, generative process, that's made up of a number of rules, these words are capable of producing an endless and infinite number of sentences. This is the beauty of language. It looks like digits. How many digits do we have? From zero to nine, only 10 digits. But how many numbers? Infinite. This is the creativity and productivity and recursiveness of the human language. Also, we shouldn't, and according to Chomsky, confused between language and communication, because communication can be achieved by things or by means other than linguistic means. Everything can communicate. The way we walk, the way we dress, the way we talk, the way we move, our body order, about body gestures, and so on, we can communicate, but language is something else. And then what's grammar? And the core of language we have grammar. What's grammar? Grammar is not in books. Grammar is not in books, because what we have in books is just a simulation of what we think to be there. And all grammar books cannot account for the grammatical knowledge of any human being, because it's vast. Our grammatical knowledge is innate and very vast, abundant, 
and the unconscious. We do not know that we know grammar. And that's why even if you look at how we teach grammar, the other schools, some people say don't teach grammar. Just let people be immersed in the language and they will learn grammar. And let grammar care about itself. And the others say, no, we teach grammar. But grammar is not true. Grammar is mental. And we know it. And it doesn't need any teaching, by the way. It doesn't need any, any teaching or any instruction or intervention. Why? Because it's about the core of our human language faculty. And there is a mental linguist in every one of us. Every one of us has a, is a mental linguist installed in every one of us. We know what's right and what's wrong. We know what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. We know that this is uh, an archaic word and this is not an archaic. This register is suitable in this situation and this is not, and so on. We all are all having this interest in language because language is our way, our way to communicate and also to have social aspirations being fulfilled. Because when we talk, everything is told about us. Where are we from? Who we are? What's our gender? Our sex? And our education? And so on and so forth. Okay? And then, let's ask, what are the unique words of human language? What makes human language different from other non-human communication systems? And we have Charles Hockett and the American linguist, who has proposed something called the design of the, uh, of the, era of the uh, human language. And he has cited a number of unique properties that make really this language unique. One of them is displacement. And what's displacement? By human language is capable of moving beyond here and now. We can talk about here and we can talk about places we have never been before. We can talk about imaginative places, things we haven't been before. Okay, and this literature, look at literature. Literature is a sort of imagination and because we have this talent of imagination and of this displacement property, our imagination can, can get us to places that are really imaginable. Also, open, 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 uh, open endedness. The human language is not limited. Can anyone tell me how many words in any language, how many sentences? We can't. Why? Because it's creative and we cannot have such calculations. Number three, discreteness. Discreteness. Human language is made of whatever the language is made of. Yes, uh, I said, Thank you very much and I wish you good seminar. And then we have discreteness. And what's discreteness? Discrete means separate, individual, short sounds. Okay? Imagine that every sound we have has a particular meaning. How many sounds do we have? And how many sounds human languages all can have in total? It's about 100. If every sound had one meaning, this means that human communication can only import only 1,000 messages and it will be locked into a very close system of communication, just like non-human communication. Thank God that we do not know what's the meaning of ka, or what's the meaning of ta, or what's the meaning of pa, or what's the meaning of a, or c, or d, or whatever. These things are meaningless, but when combined, they make words and when combined, they make utterances and so on and so forth. And this is the beauty of the of language. Duality also, when we get words out of cells. Stimulus freedom. We are not down to a particular stimulus that makes us respond in a particular way. We can talk about anything in any place. We are not down to by time or bound by place. This is the human imagination. What makes it this way, it's language. Okay? Um, 
arbitrariness. What's arbitrariness? It's the, uh, in, you know, the indirect relationship between, what's the relationship between a word and its reference in reality? No logical relationship, no direct relationship. It's just a matter of conventional arbitrary relationship. Okay? And, and it's also one of the main, uh, you know, stresses of the human language. Because it makes us set uh, free from restrictions of this close relationship between the signified and the signifier and so on. Iconicity, also another property of human language. When we have sounds or words that are reflecting the sounds they are saying, for example, splash, okay, uh, push, bish, etc., and so on. Finally, control transmission. Human language is not inherited. It's not inherited. Someone who is being born, for example, in London and his parents are Japanese, he's not going to talk Japanese. He's going to talk English, to speak English. Why? Because although his genetic makeup is Japanese, his ethnicity is something and language is something else. Genetics is something and the language is something else. You understand? And then let's move to what makes human language also different. It's the structure of the it's the structure of the human vocal tract. Look at it. Here is a comparison between the vocal tract of an A and the vocal tract of a human being. If you look at the structure of the two, you will find significant differences. One of them is that, if you look at the human, uh, you know, if you look at the human vocal tract, you find that number one, the mouth is small, which allows us to speak and to move, make mouth movements. Okay, number two, the teeth are upright, they are not sporty, like here, they are sporty. The sporting, the uh, the right? Not to say you can highlight the word uh, corn, actually. It's not linked to any corn here, but here in the eggs, it's linked. What makes it okay? What? Because it's not linked here, it makes a space in the fans. And fans here is used as a resonating chamber that amplifies our sound and allows us to speak more conveniently. Also, you can say in your dust, the impulse in the human uh, vocal tract, you find that it's small. If you compare it to the impulse here, okay, you'll find that it is it is big. What does this mean? It means that the impulse, because it, it shuts the wind fire and it uh, uh, doesn't allow food to get into the wind fire, it also makes our pharynx wider. And because our pharynx is wider, our resonating chambers are really echoing and improving the frequencies of our sounds and make them really what they are, amplifying them, giving them a sense and deep and less. Okay? This is as well as the differences. However, there are similarities. Humans and the apes, they have teeth, they have tongues, they have So why don't uh, apes speak? Why don't apes speak? And why do we? Uh, why are we the only creatures who are capable of producing something like human language? If you look at this, you'll find that, and I want to show this, please. This is the structure of the human brain. Look at this. This is the most important. Okay, and these are the different parts of language areas. The motor cortex gives instructions to the larynx muscles. Okay? Humans are the only creatures who have full control of this. On the other hand, apes do not have this. They do not have control on the motor cortex more cortex and the larynx muscles. This missing link, this missing link is a key reason why it shares the same DNA 
almost 99% uh, from uh, speaking, it doesn't allow them to speak. This is one thing. Another thing, if you look at here, this is Baroque's region in the front of you, okay, and this is responsible for language English and speech English. And here is also a nice uh, area uh, close to the auditory cortex. It's uh, responsible for language reception and understanding. If you look at, look at this, in all mammals and the rights, there is a link between Baroque's region and the auditory cortex. In all mammals, including all new dolphins, uh, whales, whatever. Okay, there is a, a, a relation or a connection, neural connection between this region, Baroque's uh, region, and the other cortex. Only humans, only humans who have this additional neural pathways that are responsible. In black, uh, uh, the first way in red and the one in blue, which are responsible for what? For making synthesis and brain. Additional neural pathways and synapses, more activation of the brain, and through millions and billions of neurons of our of our brain. So, uh, uh, non humans have only this neural connection. The humans have these two additional neural connections which make human language really possible, genetically and biologically possible. Okay? And then let's ask um, language production and perception, speech chain. Okay? Speech chain. Look at this. Look at this. Okay? And uh, here we have three parts the speaker. The ear and the listener. Okay? The speaker. The speaker, the process starts with an idea that's formulated in the brain of the speaker. And how ideas are formulated in the brain through chemical and electromagnetic interactions that are done by billions and billions of neurons in our brain. Okay? But, but, and how do they do that? They have, for example, we have something called semantic memory. And there has been semantic memory. All words are organized in a particular way. So I want to formulate an idea. I get a word from here and I get a word from there in the different areas in the brain and then I mix them. They fire together and make a circuit. You go with my back and make a circuit. And this circuit makes the idea. For me, that it's through chemical interactions. Okay? Once the idea is formulated in the brain, okay, the cortex, the motor cortex, gives instructions to the larynx muscles and to the other organs of speech to act in order to turn this idea into speech waves or sound waves. Once these sound waves are moving in the air, as you see, making compressions, beats and drops, beats and drops as you see in the air, until it reaches the ears of the, of the listener and it hits the eardrum. And in hitting the eardrum, it moves its three little, so three little balls here. You know, and then it moves to this spiral shape, which is cochlea. This cochlea, cochlea, cochlea this uh, cochlea, cochlea, this cochlea turns the sound waves into sensory data. Into sensory data, sent to the brain, sent to the brain, to the brain to process and to understand, and so on. On the other hand, the speaker has another job to do, which is uh, to make feedback, to know that or to make sure that what he said is really what he wants to say. Okay? This is as far as, so we start with change, start with linguistic level and ideas that turn into 
words, and then it ends with also ideas that reach the brain of that. This is the chain, and the chain goes on and on and on. And here we get this, again, we get this part, which is the speech waves, okay, and some waves, and we want to convert it into visual shape. Visual shape, and this is what we call a spectrogram, which is a representation of our speech signals. What is in our speech signal? Here is a representation of the word children like strawberries. Children like strawberries. Look at this. You'll find that there are five bits on the word which are periodic. These are representing the vowels. The vowels. If you look at the ch, ch, for example, as you see, it's a consonant and uh, it involves high intensity. There is no periodic um, frequency. And if you go to M or Ch, Ch, this is the vowel M. And we know how do we know vowels? We know vowels by peaks of energy called, called what? Called formants. Formant number one, formant number two, formant number three, and so on. And these formants are peaks of energy that take place in the vocal tract in our mouth. If our mouth has open, is closed, and if our tongue is for, put forward, retracted, and so on. Every shape we have in the mouth affects the way this visual representation is marked. And then we have the human tongue. Okay, this is a plus of consonant. Plus of yani, yani in, in our breast is hold in a particular point of time. This is why it doesn't have a representation. It's a white area here. If you look at it right, right is a vowel like sound, which means that it has formless, just like vowels. And mm, which is the schwa and lang, as you see also, it looks like by the sound. But at the end of the day, there are uh, consonants and so on. So here we have a uh, lot of things. What exactly do we understand? Or what exactly do we listen? And how do we listen? How do we listen? We listen through two things. Number one, we receive the outer signal. Someone was speaking. Okay? And then we process the way we sound until it reaches our brain. And what happens is that our brain makes an incredible mix between the signal and the memory it has. And making a match between the signal that's incoming and the repertoire or the archive it has. If there is a match, then we identify, yes, I listened to this before, I understand its meaning, it's said by X and Y and so on. If, if it doesn't match with something already there in the memory or in the archive, we say, no, this is the first time I hear something like that. I don't understand. Let me say it again and so on. What we say, what we listen, what we understand is something special. Two people can listen to the same thing, to the same speaker, and each one processes the signal and the message on his own way. So what I understand would be different from Dr. what Dr. Ahmed has understood although we are listening to the same speaker in the same context at the same time. Why? Because what I have in my mind, in my brain, my, my, my cognitive package and my cognitive arsenal, okay, is different from Dr. Ahmed's. You understand? This is why listening and understanding is so personal. Just like comprehension, just like reading, like just like reading literary works and so on. And we have reception theory and the reader in the text and so on and all these things which resonate and go around this idea. What do we also what do we hear? We hear all the problems of the sounds. Sounds here, 
was not a which is that and was not a small in closer consonants in vowels or was not a mean stress intonation was not a rhythm was not a man again when I listen I make instant judgment I like the speaker was I like to go on listening to him I like it or I don't like it what he is saying that appeals to me doesn't appeal to me a judge the speaker make judgment was there someone to trust someone who you cannot trust someone who is uh, has deep knowledge doesn't have deep knowledge you know we make large instant judgment when we listen the, from the first sentence someone or sound someone is speaking as is an incredible thing called perception speech perception and of course we do these millions of things without knowing that we do them because they are un unconscious because they are unconscious okay and these are the two processing mechanism the bottom up bottom up what's coming from the outside world through our senses because our senses act as interface between us and the outside world we cannot have access to our to the outside world without our senses and our brain cannot understand the world except through the lens of our senses you understand and the, this due to this interaction between what's coming from the outside world and what we have okay we get what we call understanding comprehension perception and so on and so on Then we move to language, thought, and worldview. What is the relationship between language and thought? Some people say that thought is inner speech. Some people say no. Speech is something, and language is something, and thought is something else because we can think in ways other than linguistic ways, images. But in language, how we can affect our, our soul in one imagination. Things that are not linguistic, but at the same time, they are complex, just like language. Okay? However, we have another term in the relationship between language and thought, because thought is said to either shape the way we see the world, or affect or influence the way we see the world. And we have two series, or one series in two versions, which is linguistic relativity, it is the light version, and linguistic determinative, it is the strong version, the weak and the strong version. And the, this theory has been instituted by two great scholars, linguists, anthropologists, uh, American anthropologists, um, we have uh, Worf, Uh, uh, Sapir, sorry, Edward Sapir and his student were within the bill of this year that human language affects the way, or shapes the way people see the world and their world view. Okay? This series has been, uh, you know, fluctuating in fame and in popularity. In the 40s and 50s, it was in its heydays. And then uh, it went into deterioration and fell into oblivion. And then it revived and uh, is re being uh, re under resurrection nowadays. And so on and so forth. But the idea that language is affected by song, or and, sorry, our song is affected by language is something that we cannot ignore in one way or another. And it comes, what, how, how did this idea came to the uh, linguistry? It came from uh, Benjamin B. Worf, who was working as an inspector in an insurance company. And uh, he found that uh, the workmen are dealing directly with the uh, petrol uh, you know, barrels, as you see, um, empty. When they are empty, they deal with them recklessly and irrationally. Although these empty barrels are more dangerous than the full barrels, because if you toss a match in one of them, they will explode, they will not burn only, you know, they will explode and make catastrophes. And why, why a massive destruction? But because of the word, because of the word empty, the word empty affects the behavior, 
and their complexion and make them behave irrationally. From this instant, uh, uh, so he noticed from this instant, he starts to generalize or to come up with the idea that really language affects thought and the way we see things and believe. And um, let me give you another example. This is um, one of the British teachers after uh, reopening a couple of months ago. And look at the crowdedness and how this which and other teachers are picked by visitors and swimmers and so on. And look at the tons and tons of rubbish that they have left here. Uh, simply because what? The, 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 the pandemic, the coronavirus pandemic, pandemic never ends, by the way, but, but it, because of the word reopening, the word reopening, the word itself makes people behave in such a way, which really is another piece of evidence that language affects the way we believe, the way we think, and the way we believe. And we have other things uh, that we can say to illustrate that language affects our soul. Uh, for example, lexicalization. Um, we have uh, languages which have apes distinction in terminology between apes and monkeys. There's no words. This is an example. Uh, look, Eskimo languages. There are many, many languages in the Eskimo area. And of course, because snow is the key word, the key object there, it has a lot of words. They use this as a piece of evidence that the red language is affecting the soul of the people uh, in a particular place. Also sexist language, you look at bachelor, the word bachelor, and the word spinster, referring to the same people, the same uh, uh, social circumstances, but look at the connotations of each one of them. You know, and uh, you know, this is so, sort of social injustice, you know, and so on. Um, I was searching for Hilma, uh, the woman uh, who asks Hola. Can we say that she is the Russi who asks Hola? Yeah, she was divorced on her on her demand. Okay, can we say that she is never seen here Mutallaka? No, because this is a lexical there. We must look for a word to describe this because Mutallaka, I think it's a sexist word, which means that the idea of divorce or the process of divorce has been imposed on her. But it's on her demand in this case that she wants to finish this relationship. So sometimes language is too, sex, too sexist to change. But there must be some, some changes, some social activism in order to change uh, these words. In order, because it's a sort of social injustice. Okay? Variation in grammar, gender, tense, and number. But we'll find that, for example, in Chinese, there is nothing called tense. Man, which has a smell, smell. Well, a present perfect, well, a Chinese. Does this mean that they do not know, they do not have time sensing? Of course, there is, because they are human beings. But they use, they do, they, they do not have time sensing forms. They have time forms. For example, I go to school yesterday, I go to school next week, I go to school tomorrow. Go, go. Okay. Also numbers. They don't have numbers. They say seven book, eight book, nine book, and so on. Also we have in other languages. You find the majority of sentences are in the passive. Who will have in passive? The book is the act. Where is the door of the action? No one. For example, in Korean and in Spanish. Okay, the window is open. The window is, uh, is broken. Who broke the window? No one. Maybe because in some societies, the door of the action is meant to be concealed. You understand? And, and so on and so forth. Uh, color terms were one of the areas which, which show how language is affecting thought. Look at how many 
colors? How many color? How many colors do we have in in reality? Can anyone tell me? Of course we can't. Billions, billions of color. Does this mean that we should assign a name for each color and each shade of color? Of course it's impossible. And so we have something called basic color terms. In some languages, they have only two color names. White and black. طب ده معناه هم شايفين أول بقى شايفين بس all light colors are white and all black colors and all you know dark colors are black and so on. And we have languages function with three color names, four color names, nine and the maximum number is eleven. Does this mean that eleven color names are not known? Look at the the color green. Strong is a greener in a particular area. Would you be able to give a sh the name of a shade of green, green shade uh, for every tree, every plant you see? Of course not. And why do we we, we spare ourselves this panic and this heartache and this headache? Because this is one of the beauty of human being, generalization. We want to generalize. We do not give names to trees for economy of energy. We do not want to give names to animals. We don't want to give names to every plant. And this is why we have something called the plant blindness. We do not see plants because we do not give them names. Although they are fellow creatures, part of our ecosystem. Aspects of an Arab khamas which are coming out. Aspects of language study. Okay. Aspects of language. How do we study this particular simple language? We have in the four areas here the classic sciences. Long way. And we have sounds studied by phonetics and phonology. Structure studied by syntax, grammar, morphology. We have sense studied by what? Semantics. Should I? These are the four sciences. And this lasted for until 50 years ago when we have this shift to study function of language. Language from a functional perspective. We start to study by a pragmatics, how language is used in particular contexts in society, and uh, uh, how meaning is created by these speakers in the course of communication, and so on and so forth. And then we get the wider, you know, the wider uh, scope of linguistics in order to find that linguistics as a prayer, as a science, is literally, happening, literally, interacting with every single science you can ever think of. It interacts with every single science. Think of any science, you'll find that language in linguistics is there. In medicine, and how language disorder and, uh, and language therapy and all these things. In engineering, and look at artificial language and artificial intelligence, the nature of language processing, and, and, and how to convert speech into writing and convert writing into speech and speakers and, and simultaneous interpreting and machine translation and all these things. We find that lingu linguistics interact with psychology in order to have this wonderful science called psycholinguistics to give us some insight into how language acquisition takes place, how language loss takes place, how language learning you know, takes place, and, and so on. Language in your access society, in order to have this wonderful science, which is sociolinguistics and anthropological linguistics and uh, all these, uh, you know, uh, sciences. A snowgraphy of the speech, uh, uh, sociology of language, all these sciences are working on how language is functioning in a particular society and affecting it and being affected by, 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 by language. Because language, at the end of the day, language is a social practice, and which, which reflects 
the social and dominant powers of every society and reflects the ideologies and the values and the principles of this society. You understand what we learn in education? Education itself is an ideological institution because national states are trying to make people go in a particular stereotype in order to serve a particular policy. Linguistics is in the heart, at the heart of everything here. Applied linguistics is very important. The applied linguistics and how it's very fast and you'll find it everywhere and just almost in everything around us. Okay, linguistics and literature, you know, I had no lecture, yeah, I knew. And, uh, and how is linguistics, you know, sheds light on the beauty of literary work. Sometimes you find that the stylistic reading really is something different. And how we read and reread and the perception theory and all critical studies and critical theories and critical schools are interacting with us. And this is a multidisciplinary uh, work that we should aspire to and fight for. Because no single theory, or no single science can give us all the answers to the question on a particular issue. And you shouldn't work on separate islands. This is the beauty of science, where we collaborate, because we come to learn together, and everyone is contributing to our understanding of any process. Okay? I'm not going to talk about neurolinguistics and uh, how yeah, neuroscience is what is making a revolutionary work in understanding how language is created and uh, brain imaging and um, uh, the, all the work of uh, artificial intelligence and natural processing and machine translations and so on are working on the, um, uh, the foundations of neuroscience work and cognitive uh, science, cognitive sciences and neurosciences. Uh, they are leading the march nowadays. They are in the front because they are giving us something new, something new. Um, also, we have forensic linguistics and so on, so on, and so forth. Um, philosophy of language, we always say that philosophers are the, the torch of light in any science. They are the people who make advances, real, tangible advances. And this is why real professor cannot and we find someone, except after every every 500 years, you can have one professor, one uh, philosopher, someone you can say, this is a philosopher, you understand? Uh, and so on and so forth. And uh, artificial intelligence thinks about the future, aha moments ahead. Artificial intelligence developing the machines or computer programs that are capable of doing tasks requiring intelligence. That's simple definition. Lima Yusanna did artificial intelligence. Developing programs that make intelligent things or things or tasks that need intelligence. Just like humans or similar to you. So we, they simulate the human cognitive abilities. Um, for example, we have uh, sound recognition, sound text conversion, machine translations, materials interpreting, and the new thing I want to talk about is bot or deep writing. You know that Shakespeare and uh, Charles Dickens have died or have passed away several centuries, <laughs> but uh, the good news is that deep writing and bot writing and bot literature is resurrecting them and you will enjoy no sonnets by Shakespeare and no novels by Dickens and so on. How? It's compiling all the words of Shakespeare, for example, and educating the, pro the uh, computer through algorithms to make uh, things which are similar but new uh, from the data. Uh, the programs have, for example, uh, Shakespearean, all Shakespearean uh, drama and all Shakespearean poetry and so on will be in a particular data 
uh, repertoire and the algorithm of a particular program will work on this data in order to write new poetry from Shakespeare's poetry that's similar to uh, Shakespeare's poetry. What happens is that they made this experiment and they tested a number of uh, people to see if this belongs to Shakespeare or not, if this belongs to Dickens or not. Fortunately, I mean, the mom are going in 50%. About 55% of the people were fooled by the computer. And they passed, they passed, they passed, they passed, they passed, they passed, when we, the dividing line between the human work and the machine work will be blurred. And we cannot decide if this is machine work or human work. This is touring test. Okay? Um, Finally, at the Hegel, we have called the world is far too rich to be expressed in a single language. With the Hegel, Hegelstein, the limits of my language are the limits of my world. That language should not be seen as a barrier. On the language of sort of kind of language should not be seen as a barrier to our access to varied, rich, and real world experience. Each language is a way of understanding and interpreting the world, says Chomsky, and not a way of constructing our perception. Should be open and not, and, and, and what we call, um, you know, Political correctness and the linguistic imperialism and the linguistic racism. All the identity. We should set ourselves from free from all this and be tolerant and be open to all languages and all dialects. And as we have dialect chain, we must be different from the dialect. That we like and that is like and we like to like and that these things must be abolished. Because your dialect is your whole part of who you are, you should be proud of. And you know, in Britain, for example, they are fighting in order to conserve the dialects. For dialects are linguistic repertoires for the English language. At the end of the day, we say the English language. It's not the standard language that we see in books. It's the everything that is spoken, which is or written, wherever it is. Under the umbrella of the English language. Okay? Uh, the world, Romanovich, uh, uh, chemistry, in the world is much greater than any language to describe. And because languages are our windows to the world, and the more windows, the, the better the vision. The more the windows, the better the vision. So people who are fighting in order to have linguistic uniformity and just learn one language and stick to one side, no, they are looking at the world from one window. Of course their vision will be incomplete. They will not see what part of the picture, because we cannot have access to the true picture of the world, okay? And hence it's imperative to conserve the languages, especially the endangered ones, as the loss of a language is a loss to the whole human world. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Lena, for uh, this very interesting, thorough presentation of such a very important topic, understanding human language. And actually, um, we, have, we have enjoyed so much listening to this presentation because uh, you, Professor, spoke about the importance of language in every field of life, politics, science, everything in life, actually. And I uh, enjoyed so much uh, you, Professor, speaking about, you know, uh, the green color itself. 
and the, the planets and the scenery and how the green color itself is not the same actually you know you, we, you can see a green color in one tree and it is quite different from you know the same green color in a different tree so this is the same way we are human beings we are you know the inhabitants of this world but we speak so many languages and God Almighty created us male and female this is the difference you know there is difference all right and he created us different but in order to communicate in order to know each other in order to have relationships in order to have this communication basically language is about communication basically this is what God Almighty Allah Almighty wants us to have relationships good relationships between us human beings شركه مولو ميديا ترجو لكم دوام المناسبات السعيده